Okay, so as you can see, I slightly changed the title of my presentation to Curating Media Art On-Site and Online, as it is, describes much better how and where we encounter art, physically in museums or on the net. In my presentation, I will first introduce the specific context and program of HEC, the institution that I'm directing since uh, 2012. In the second part, I will focus on our collection and the challenges and difficulties, difficulties we are facing preserving software and net-based artworks. The third part is dedicated to some of our latest exhibitions, their specific topics, curatorial concepts and challenges. In the last part, I, would, I want to showcase some projects and strategies we initiated during the lockdown in the spring of this year and the current unstable and difficult uh, situations museum all over the world are facing uh, within that uh, pandemic. So, HEC is a multidisciplinary institution showcasing visual arts, but also electronic music, performances, dance, and uh, other forms of media related uh, performances. The institution was founded in 2011 and we opened our doors to the general public uh, in this building in November 2014. HEC's activities focus on the presentation and the mediation of digital culture and the new art forms of the information age. We show contemporary art that explores and uses new media technology technologies and their cultural and social impact on society. In our programming activities, we focus on works that use digital technologies as tools for production and that take advantage of the digital medium's inherent characteristics. But we also showcase works that reflect the input of media technologies on our society that describe our current condition in an age when digital processes are shaping our actions and inform our understanding of the world. I give you several examples. Here, uh, an image from our international group show, Ecovisionaries, that investigated new media technologies and techno-scientific methods in the arts and their significance for the perception and awareness of the ecological. The exhibition pleaded for a both caring and experimental and open approach to the environment after the Anthropocene. So theories that have inspired us are by Lynn Margulis, the evolution of symbiosis, uh, evolution by symbiosis, or Donna Haraway, the kinship of species and relations to non-human beings. And in the image here, in the foreground, you see a work by uh, the artist Vanessa Lorenzo, a touch-sensitive moss work that uh, sounded uh, when people were touching it, kind of getting us again closer connected to nature. Uh, another example, a solo show by uh, Lawrence Leck with the title Farsight Freeport. It was an interesting exhibition uh, because uh, Lawrence was kind of creating a Gesamtkunstwerk where he was taking over our space and putting it into the future of 2065, where uh, HEC became uh, a global free port and uh, everything was uh, driven by AI systems. And uh, yeah, here you can see a glimpse of what that looked like. And here, a very different project that we did in the spring this year, uh, an international group show titled Making Fashion Sense, uh, which focused on sustainability and fashion, a quite new approach on that topic. And we also showcased research uh, into new materials and digital fashion. And here you can see how we uh, organized the show. So it we worked together with a scenographer who created that boxes that were uh, kind of like shop windows, but also like the changing rooms that people know when they are uh, buying uh, fashion. And uh, on the practical side, they were also securing, securing the works uh, from touch by the visitors. 
Well, examples about the multidisciplinarity here, a concert by Ryoji Ikeda, the Japanese uh, artist and musician. Another example, the interactive performance uh, uh, Inferno by the Canadian artists Louis-Philippe de Mer and Bill Bourne, where visitors were wearing exoskeletons that were directed by the artists and they made them dance to music according to their decisions. So it was actually quite more comfortable when you are letting go and let the machine take over and move, uh, move you to the sounds of music uh, than trying to fight it. And another example, uh, a VR dance piece by the dance company Chil Chopin from Geneva, VRI, where several visitors could interact in VR with one another but also with the virtual dancers. And you see here in the far uh, in, this, in the corner what the VR actually looked like. And the small person, for example, is one of the avatars that people could choose. And the tall figures were the virtual dancers that interacted with them. And Shil was really playing very nicely with this moment in virtual reality, people be could become giants or dwarfs. So uh, the space relation was quite important for him. And one last very exceptional outdoor piece that we could realize um, is the anticipatory installation voice theater by Mexican-Canadian artist uh, Rafael Lozano Hemmer. And it was, this was special because it took place in a 2,000-year-old Roman theater close to Basel in uh, Augusta Raurica. And uh, how did it work? See here, visitors could leave messages via a megaphone, and these got transformed into light signals, and the messages also got stored and came back as memories for others to listen to. And this was then what it was looking like at night, and it was really kind of giving the platform to the visitors, to the users, and uh, reactions were quite different. So we had, uh, statements about art and culture, but also uh, love letters to other people and so on. So this is actually also was, uh, what Raphael likes, that it's uncontrollable. It's really what the visitors make out of it. Then I briefly want to touch on another important aspect of uh, our work at HEC. It's the educational uh, activities that have been designed as a standalone program. Uh, they have a strong focus on uh, hands-on workshops for a young and older audience to get better understanding of media, hardware, and software. And another focus lies also on the direct uh, work uh, with other artists. So here I show you just some examples of uh, workshops that we here we realized, here more software-based. And here, an example for a workshop that we did with Adi Wagenknecht, where uh, the audience could play around with uh, mini drones and create paintings with them. Then I'm already in the second part, uh, the collection of HEC, which has a focus on software and net-based art. An important part of our work is building up a collection of digital art with a focus on uh, Swiss media art. We are mainly uh, devoted to collect uh, network-based projects and, and thus preserve an artistic practice which represents a special challenge for musealization. In the question of preserving digital or so-called born digital art, museums are faced with new tasks since these works are not invariable objects that can be stabilized according to a classical understanding of preservation. In this this respect, digital art has a great proximity to performance as new states can arise in any sequence or every performance of a computer program. HEC has one of the largest collections of software-based art, even in relations to museums internationally. At the moment, our collection has about uh, 80 works. And as I said, with this focus on software and net-based artistic practice. The development of the maintenance infrastructure and optimization of the workflow 
uh, at the HEC is still in progress and it is a never ending task since not only the works of art, but also the infrastructure becomes obsolete uh, with a, uh, within uh, a few years. The preservation of uh, individual works can be very costly and uh, requires a good understanding of the work, technical know-how and a certain level of creativity. Unlike the books in the library, each work of digital art is fundamentally different. Works of digital art can often be described as an unbound practice. On the one hand, they are interwoven with a standard uh, software that every computer has, such as an operating system. On the other hand, they often show dependencies on specific software libraries and hardware components. Sometimes it's, it is also difficult to specify the content of the work. You just saw the example by Rafael Lozano Hammer where the content is created uh, by uh, the audience. Media artworks are often described as being immaterial, but this is actually not the case. Think of the aspect of materiality in the software and hardware duality. Information is interpreted by a machine which creates a readable output for us. Media carriers need a playback device to be interpreted. Digital files need a computer and monitor to interpret and output the files. Digital art without material does not exist. The next aspect, aspect I would like to talk about are conservation strategies. As hardware becomes obsolete over time, either the artworks have to be adapted, that's what uh, migration means, or their hardware and software environment has to be adapted, which is called emulation. There are different levels of migrations. Those with only small changes, for example, the source code is kept, or those with large changes, which is often means a complete reprogramming of a piece. Sometimes neither migration nor emulation is possible, typically for artworks that rely on specific platforms, such as Facebook or Twitter, for example. Such platforms evolve quickly and no longer offer certain features in their updates. Then you have to think about whether documentation can replace the work or whether the work should be completely reinterpreted. Uh, some notes about the acquisition or pre-acquisition process. We often have to uh, define first what is the works, what are the dependencies, is there an unbound practice, and I will show an example later with a net-based work that uh, is such a case, how, needs, uh, how does the work uh, need to be presented, what exactly is handed over, uh, licenses, etc. And ideally, um, we can create a rough estimate of the effort required to restore, maintain, present and archive the work. And I show an image here of one of our works, a VR installation by Melody Musi. Actually, what we have is kind of this hard drive uh, with the data on it. It makes sense uh, to involve conservators or uh, other people with a certain technical know-how in, in these discussions with artists or galleries. In any case, it's important to pass on the information from these discussions to the curators or, uh, yeah. Um, here about the a digital infrastructure that I mentioned uh, earlier. HEC has a digital archive, just as other museums have a museum de depot for works of art. The work components stored in a digital archive are not operational, they are archived and should not change. I don't go into detail here, but just to give you an idea. Another part of the digital infrastructure is the web server. It is quasi as the exhibition space for the web-based artworks. The works presented on the web server are operational. They work and visitors can interact with them. The challenge of the web server is that older works of art have to use older server versions, which are uh, security uh, holds. 
The question is therefore how to set up the web server so that no damage is done when a work of art is attacked by viruses, for example. In addition, the maintenance work must be kept as low as possible. Last but not least, the internet users must be able to access it. That means emulations of old browsers must be made available online. And now to the physical part of the works. For this, we also need an appropriate depot. And here you see several components from our collection. The McGilly suit, for example, by Nobotic Research. It's part of a performance documented on a website. And the suit and the website are part of the work. So sort of like a remains of the original performance. Then the hack has reserved a certain monitor that you see in the corner for uh, a work called Alle Bilder Generator by Philipp Maderin, because these kinds of screens are hard to get by now. So therefore the screen was assigned uh, to the depot for artworks because it is just used for that presentation. And the equipment storage in general includes current devices that are not assigned to specific works. It is also not subject to special climate condition. That's really kind of like the, the technical depot uh, where we have uh, projectors and uh, screens and so on. Some examples. Yesterday evening, uh, I typed in uh, Ljubljana uh, in the uh, pioneering online work from a Swiss net artist, uh, Beat Brogle, one word movie, which uh, originates in 2003. And uh, this is, um, users here can type in uh, a word and it's based on Google, Google's powerful search engine and then it's searching for images and creates a movie on that word. And you see the, uh, the web address here, actually, that's the link to the original online artwork. And you have, will see two options. You can either go into the migrated version, that's what you see here on my screen, or you can also uh, uh, check out the emulated version, which is the version that gives you the look and feel of what the work has been like in 2003. Um, but of course, it also shows the dependency of museums to big internet corporations when we try to preserve such a work, uh, because the threat here is distributed obsolescence. So when uh, Google does not uh, enable the, an, an API kind of a connection uh, anymore, then there's nothing that uh, we can do. Another example here, a work by Melody Musi, one of the first VR works in uh, Switzerland. Uh, we were looking for ourselves in each other's. And here again, another example for a dependency on tech companies as these works are, or this work is uh, hardware dependent as well on the uh, Oculus Rift technology. And another work uh, from the collection uh, that is uh, very hardware specific uh, from Erwe Graumann, Raul Victor, Cherchez, Son Stil from 1999. And you see here uh, an alter ego, an avatar of a painter in the computer, which was important that it's really a box like a house or a room. And then he's painting something and whenever he leaves the door to the left, uh, a uh, a painting is printed out and uh, visitors could take it uh, with them as an original. So uh, the, here's an interesting case as the artist has already developed his own strategy to keep the work operational. And here you see that he has developed a smartphone app uh, that can uh, be used now. Of course, it's a different look and feel altogether. It's kind of like the same concept, but uh, it's a different work and uh, you can download it for free uh, on the App Store, which is called Raoul Pictor uh, Mega Painter. And meanwhile, it also has features like this that you can uh, work with more augmented reality and take some of the images from Raoul Pictor into your home, make photos and so on. So now 
I, I would like to present uh, three exhibitions that have uh, that we I have been uh, curating uh, over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, I'm personally very interested in thematic exhibitions that focus on current developments. And the examples I would like to mention briefly here are uh, based on the advances in the life sciences to artificial intelligence or the current uh, topic on emotions and uh, technology, uh, sh real feelings, the show that is still on until uh, next Sunday in Basel. The advances of the life sciences is the focus of the exhibition Lynn Hirschman uh, Leeson Antibodies. The American artist and filmmaker is one of the pioneers of media art. Since the 1960s, she has raised issues in her works about the interaction of media and identity and the changing relationship between the body and technology. Hirschman Leeson coined the term antibody to refer to a virtual identity in cyberspace in her research and in her works. As developments in biotechnology present the newest challenge of our times, according to her, her current works are dedicated to these. Biological advancement, gen genetic research and antibody research are the threads of the show that mimic uh, a biotechnological laboratory. So as you can see here, that this, uh, the, the first phase that visitors are entering they are invited to put on a lab coat before entering the exhibition, which was also a typical uh, lab door. So to enter into that space that is usually not open to us. In the various rooms, topics such as regenerative medicine, genetic engineering uh, are addressed. Uh, one room that I'm showing here is showing developments in antibody research. In fact, the exhibition included a scientific collaboration with the pharmaceutical company Novartis, whose headquarters are here in Basel, which built an antibody for the artist that reproduced her name in its molecular structure. And that's actually what you can see here on uh, le the left side of the image. And uh, I have to say that was quite exciting because when Lynn Hirschman, when we decided to do that show with that particular focus, she asked me if I could connect her to scientists. And it was not at all clear. Uh, she just wanted to have an, an exchange. Uh, and when uh, we found Thomas Hooper, who is a senior researcher at Novartis, he then suggested that he could build that antibody that was, of course, amazing for Lynn Hirschman as the term antibody had such a relevance in her uh, earlier work even. And as you can see here, they also gave us some scientific equipment that we could use in the exhibition. And here, uh, the last room, uh, which was also again uh, behind uh, a closed uh, lab door, uh, you could see uh, at, uh, at this antibody displayed in a test tube together with another vial containing DNA. In that DNA, uh, all data, pictures, video, documents of the exhibition was stored. So it's also a reflection on DNA as a biological uh, uh, memories uh, storage that is now uh, investigated. So, and then, of course, also for that exhibition, very personal, also sort of like the legacy of Lynn Hirschman Leeson as it really contained uh, the whole exhibition in that vial. Another example is the exhibition uh, Entangled Realities from 2019, which has focused on the reality building effects of AI and its use as an artistic tool that creates new and unpredictable visual worlds and artifacts. Through the interaction with intelligent algorithmic systems and the empowerment that we already give to machines in various processes and areas of life, new intertwined realities are created. The works presented in the exhibition showed how these algorithms 
uh, algorithmic networks see uh, the world and also create the world. What the artistic works have in common is that they illustrate the processes of machine learning and give us insight into machine methods of cognition and perception, which we otherwise only experience as a black box. Our living world that uh, was uh, our, our thesis is shaped and co-designed by AI, and it is important to consciously shape this new interaction between man and machine. And I'm only showing well here, maybe just briefly on what you see here. That's also the perspective from uh, when visitors are entering into the exhibition space. And in the middle, you see a work by Mario Klingemann uh, called Uncanny Mirror. And uh, you see a camera on top of that screen that is filming the person. And it's uh, um, an adversarial neural network that is processing that information and showcasing how it has learned to interpret facing and trying to build the face that is seen through the camera. Um, but the, exa the example that I would like to show uh, is uh, an artwork by the Swiss artist group Fabrik, to, because we asked them, uh, we commissioned the work uh, to develop a software for the exhibition in which an artificial intelligence plays through the various possibilities of the exhibition uh, scenography. So the basis for this experiment is provided by practical specifications. We told uh, the algorithm how much wall system we have, lighting, sound, and technical requirements of the works. And in addition, uh, criteria were developed uh, that link the works with respect to different uh, themes. So uh, already here in this image, please have a close look to the strange or maybe strange placement of walls and the erratic uh, selection of wall paint. So what happened? And now I show you images from the algorithm uh, working on the task of building and uh, building that exhibition. So what was uh, interesting that the algorithm fragmented everything. It broke everything up into parts. And so I would think of a wall that I need as a long wall or a room, but here you can see that the algorithm just took everything into parts and built uh, the space like that, or here kind of just another uh, perspective. And from the very beginning, I was not sure if it would have uh, an interesting outcome. And uh, Boris Magrini and myself, we were the curators of the show. We already made some kind of uh, lineup of the works, but we both felt that it was a bit, uh, that something was missing. And then that when we first saw these images from the algorithm working on the scenography, uh, that was quite inspiring for us because we would never have broken up these walls into, into parts. And so we did not build the exhibition according to a suggestion from the algorithm, but we changed the placement of the walls and we generated a quite unique and dynamic structure for this show. So working uh, with the AI was really doing the trick for us to develop a uh, kind of a new system. And I think it's uh, interesting to go away from this uh, duality man against machine but so the human with AI can really create some uh, creative output. And here you see the installation of the piece where you could see in real time the further renderings and new uh, versions that the system generated and whenever it found that something looked interesting, then it also made a printout. And on the smaller uh, screen, you can also see really the program processing uh, information. That brings me to the last exhibition that I would uh, like to uh, speak about, uh, Real Feelings, Emotion and Technology. Emotions are the core of human experience. They differentiate us from machines, but these borders seem to erode. 
The International Group Exhibition explores this rapidly changing relationship between uh, technology and emotions. We show works by 20 artists that are ranging from interactive installations to artificial intelligence, uh, animations, video installations, or photography. They explore how technology today represents, manipulates, or changes our emotions. And I have co-curated that exhibition uh, together with Ariane Kuk, uh, a curator from London, and Angelique Spannings, the director of MU Hybrid Art House uh, in Eindhoven in the Netherlands, where the exhibition will also be shown next year from March uh, to June. Right at the entrance of the show, visitors encounter vibe check by the American artists Lauren Lee McCarthy and Kyle McDonald. Uh, and this piece has been uh, commissioned uh, by us uh, for the context of the exhibition. The piece consists of, a, uh, of screens on which visitors of the exhibition are portrayed and certain emotions are attributed to them uh, from an AI system. So while walking uh, into the exhibition, visitors encounter uh, uh, cameras that film them uh, as well as people around them. The machine learning system analyzes then their emotional responses and when you come out of the exhibition, you might find yourself there being sort of judged uh, by, by this AI system. So it's not so much about following you, but really about our social interactions. And at the beginning of the show, uh, masks were not obligatory, so it worked quite well, but now uh, we are still open here. The museums are still open in Basel, but now masks are obligatory. And I think you can also see that it's quite hard for an AI system to really make sense of faces that it can actually not really uh, interpret. Dutch artist uh, Coralie Vogelaar uh, focuses on the detection and interpretation of emotionally loaded body language in her newly produced piece, Infinite Posture Dataset, uh, which you see here in uh, the middle. And I show you a short video clip. I don't really know what I'm looking for. Hopefully. <laughs> Hiding from the world. And pushing people away. Daydreaming. Oh shit. Vacuum. So for this piece, she has uh, asked the dancer, uh, or she, uh, she has a dancer move uh, on this life uh, size uh, screen or nearly life size screen that is endlessly rocking back and forth. And this was an inspiration that she took from gadgets that she found uh, that cheat the step counter on smartphones, which are already in use, for example, in Asia, or uh, particularly in China, where social scoring is already uh, taking place. The body of the dancer is reduced to a few markers, as you could see, which would make it easier for a machine learning system to decode the emotional postures that we make. So I think it's interesting as it is both, it's sort of kind of reaching out, trying to make a system understand our, our postures and emotional states. And on the other hand, it's a resilience of humans kind of hacking these systems with the step, this uh, machine sort of that uh, is also then uh, tricking technological systems again. Also commissioned, for the context of the exhibition is the work Solitary Survival Raft by British-born Lucy McRae. 
She builds machines that gently squeeze the body and hold it tight. In the global pandemic brought about by COVID-19, the touch deficit of our mediated society has changed into a fear of a future without human touch. Solitary Survival Raft addresses these issues by creating an inflatable, responsive, breathing sculpture which invites the viewer to crawl into it for safety and be embraced by its structure. So uh, here you can see the piece as, uh, as it is normal. And then uh, unfortunately also uh, due to COVID, we, were, we could not enable the piece uh, for visitors to be explored, but we had a performer who was enacting it uh, several times during the week. And when it was inflated, it became a tent, really like this survival raft, right? Where we are feeling safe. And when uh, it was uh, deflated, this is what you see on the image, which is actually uh, Lucy McGray herself testing it in the studio. You really, really got a tight embrace uh, by the fabric. Oh yeah, here's another one more detail and of course this was really a piece that really changed uh, its meaning uh, during the course of the pandemic because when Lucy started and we started to discuss the work for the show she was very much focused on kind of like the touch deficit or like the lack of intimacy that we have because we are interacting so much with our uh, technological gadgets and not with one another but now it really became kind of like when we are living in times of social distancing at least uh, in her work uh, you could be uh, hugged and embraced. Um, French artist uh, Justine Emar's video installation Co-AI Existence addresses questions of coexistence and cohabitations of humans and machines. In her poetic work, the robot Alter, who was developed by the Ishiguro Labs in Japan, reacts to the movements and verbal contact of a dancer. And I'll show you also a video here. <laughs> Yeah, so you could see, I mean, this is just excerpts from, uh, from the video, but you could see the three parts, the uh, verbal interaction between the dancer and uh, the robot, the dancing uh, to an interaction together, and the data reveal that actually shows what the algorithms are uh, perceiving. So there is no common language yet but tiny points of tactile encounters and forms of contact. It is through touch and encounter they appear to create an emotional bond. A new commission by the Swiss artist Simon Nikhil, uh, Elephant Shoes, explores how uh, 
Artificial emotional intelligence is used for hiring, for job interviews. Set in a bathroom, the work follows a character preparing for an upcoming automated job interview. The work reflects on these developments that makes us aware of the limits of objectivity of these automated systems and their categorization of deeply personal and delicate matters of emotions. Here, uh, again, a short video. Automated lip reading systems often interpret I love you as elephant juice. It does not tell what it is like for a bat to be a bat. It does not help to imagine having very poor vision and perceiving the world through reflected high frequency sound signals. Is this what it is like to be a machine learning system? Restricted by its creator's imagination? Restricted by human imagination? Yeah, also only uh, sequences uh, from from the video, and it uh, I think it shows that uh, this is more a reflection on uh, the the, philo the philosophical questions about the perception of algorithmic systems, and she's also re making a reference to uh, the philosopher Thomas Nagel, who wrote that book in the 70s. We will never know how it is like to be a bat. And you could see that bed also uh, in the story and hanging in uh, the corner of the bathroom. All the materials that she uh, uses are props uh, that are used in training data for 3D environments uh, for robotic systems, for example. And also quite telling the use of a child's voice as the voice of the narrator, again, a reflection on uh, that we often describe uh, uh, AI systems as childlike, that they are have to learn to understand uh, the world. And the last uh, example from, from that exhibition is uh, an installation by the two Korean artists, uh, Shing Seung Bak and Kim Yong Hoon. Uh, it, you see a, a half circle of so-called ocean drums, as they call it, filled with tiny metal balls which change and create ocean sounds based on the appearance of the audience. And on two sides of the exhibition space there are two tiny monitors and you could see here actually in the corner a surveillance camera that is continuously panning the space and then uh, also uh, reading or measuring the four uh, universal emotions in the face of the visitors and then counting the last hundred uh, emotions that it encountered by visitors and then transferring those to uh, a sea of emotion. So that's also the title of the work, Mind is sort of our collective uh, state of mind audified and I also show you a short video clip uh, what that actually uh, sounds like. Yeah, 
very short clip. So then I uh, come to my last part, uh, the extensive online program that we started uh, since uh, COVID-19 uh, 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 during the, the lockdown in the spring this year. So the reactions to the pandemic and the strategies uh, we as a museum developed to stay connected to uh, our communities uh, during the lockdown, but also things that we uh, started to help uh, support uh, artists. So first we were uh, focusing on our collections, on our collection now all of our works can be found uh, online on our website. A lot of the works as mentioned earlier are uh, net based anyway, so they really live on the net. Um, but all the other works are now also uh, well uh, documented and we did uh, videos where staff members were presenting works that they are personally favored and really tried kind of to, to put the focus on this. Another um, uh, project that I would like to mention is that online exhibition we link. Already in spring 2020, HEC cooperated with the Kronos Art Center in Shanghai and other international partners to jointly develop the online exhibition We Link 10 Easy Pieces. We Link has since uh, then become a new platform for presenting art online. And uh, We Link, with We Link uh, Sideways, another exhibition is now being launched uh, or has been launched actually last Friday that focuses on net art. The exhibition examines the most current forms of net art and at the same time shows uh, its historical, intellectual and artistic roots. And HEC is uh, presented with two net-based works from its collection, Minds of Concern from 2002 by the artist group Nobotic Research and Trace, uh, Trace Noise, Disinformation on Demand uh, from 2001 by the artist group Lan. And I think both historical works show very well how the internet has changed and how artists have always been uh, critical of its structures. And in Shanghai, uh, apart from the online exhibition that is co-hosted uh, by several partners, they also built a physical exhibition where visitors can engage with the works uh, on site. Apart from that, uh, the educational offers that we had went online. Here I'm just showing you uh, several examples. Uh, here, for example, we ha have a program programming club uh, for kids and uh, this became the Bit Fabric at Home and was really moderated by uh, by our educational staff. So it was not just here, you can take something, but it was really someone was behind the screens interacting uh, with uh, the kids during the, during the workshops. And some other example here, for example, uh, a Lego selfie workshop. And here another one. Um, it was interesting for us. I mean, we did that to stay connected to the community, but what actually happened was that we had a lot of new people now joining internationally or when the workshops were in German, for example, we had visitors or guests from Hamburg or from Frank Frankfurt, for example. So we also want to continue doing live workshops on site, but also have an offer of online workshops via Jitsi, for example. We, uh, not, uh, well, we also do virtual walkthroughs of exhibitions, for example, for the current exhibition, we also had several Instagram tours and uh, artist talks. But another important aspect for us has been to find ways to support artists when they cannot exhibit or, you know, a lot of exhibitions are postponed, for example. And that's why we started our series Hack Networks micro commissions for artists to be showcased on our website or social media. And during the lockdown, every week a new project was released and this program is now continued and now every month we have, uh, we present a new work. And I give you just a few examples. First one here by Jonas Lund. 
I just stare at my computer waiting for something to happen. So this project was intervening on the website of Hack, and Lund has produced a script that reveals the presence of other users in real time. Each pointer leaves traces of these movements on the screen in the form of graphics generated by an online community reminiscent of the aesthetics of the 90s. So this was really like a performance because you could just experience it for the course of one week uh, in April last uh, uh, April this year. Then here, uh, uh, Kaiken, uh, they released Ozone, a new filter and series of short performances, videos, posts, stories on Hack's Instagram account. And I'll also show you how that looks like. Ozone introduced a new uh, fictional and tongue-in-cheek digital spiritual practice called ozone layering formed during the lockdown. Users must practice still or slow movements whilst their environment moves around them. The filter maps the environment onto the user's faces, creating a personal connection. With this work, Kaiken played on trends, rituals and language used on Instagram and in social media. And another one. Uh, the Japanese artist duo Exonemo explores digital technologies in a playful and entertaining way. Their work uh, realm investigates the inconsistencies between analog and digital tools uh, or between physical and virtual reality. So realm invites the user to explore a website which is however uh, displayed differently depending on whether the user runs the desktop or mobile version of the browser. Using a computer, the image is visible, as you can see here, but there is no touch or interaction possible. Using the mobile phone, as you can see on the right, touch is possible and you will add fingerprints in real time, but you will have no vision of uh, the image. And then the last uh, project that was just released is by uh, the Italian group Iocosa. Moving tasks forward is a script that can solve the long list of tasks that flood our daily to-do lists. You can download a web-based Trello application by clicking the link on our website. Moving tasks forward uh, is part of a series of works focused on the idea of moving the world forward, which often play ironically on the double meaning of the concept of what moving forward actually is. So I hope I could give you an insight into my curatorial practice and uh, my work at uh, Heck House of Electronic Arts in Basel.